The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Franklin Templeton. At Franklin Templeton, we value the power of partnership and offer our clients a gateway to investment excellence. We bring together leading investment managers with specialized capabilities, providing investors access to a broad range of fixed income, equity, alternatives, and multi-asset strategies through one trusted global partner. Above all else, we always stay true to our commitment to create better financial futures together. Connect with us today at franklintempleton.com.au. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Coral from Semi Aged Care Navigators today. Coral, thank you for joining us on the podcast. We're going to talk a bit about the aged care system. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for the invitation, James. Nice to uh, nice to have you here. As we were just kind of chatting before uh, before we pressed record, uh, there's you know, there's a few financial advisors, myself and, and others, and Nick, who's been on the podcast before, introduced us. There's a few people that are doing aged care advice in the financial advice space. And if I think of my own experience, I think uh, that we, we can, as financial advisors, we can generally be pretty good around the numbers of your RAD and your DAP and how much it's going to cost you and how you're going to fund that, that transition into aged care. But as we were talking about before we pressed record, there's a whole lot of other things that we can try and be helpful with our clients before it even gets to there. Uh, maybe, Coral, can you just start by talking about your business, Semi Aged Care Navigators, and then we'll kind of get into the aged care system? Sure. So I'm a registered nurse, uh, James, and I have a small team of um, other registered nurses and uh, former clinicians. And as registered nurses, we were also, we've, we're former ACAT assessors. Um, and uh, we were employed in the public health system and, uh, you know, we left that system and uh, because we, particularly I saw a need um, to offer so much more. The, the, you know, the aged care system is so complex and people literally get lost in it and um, because of that complexity, they can't move forward and get the support they need. So I launched my business uh, about five years ago as an aged care navigator. So we support people to get timely access to in, particularly in-home services. That's the area that we work. So getting into and through my aged care, um, you know, through entry level, and then certainly as, uh, you know, the older person's needs increase, we uh, position them to be assessed by the aged care assessment team. Got you. And you, you work with people right across Australia? It's, you know, we do. Because the aged care program or the system is a, is a Commonwealth or federally funded program, the uh, interactions and the advice and the kind of assessments that we do are the same. You know, if we had a client in Mount Isa, as in Perth or Adelaide or anywhere in Australia. Got you. Yeah. And I think you know, as we were talking about before we press record, at least the way that we interact with clients as they're moving through that that those needs for aged care, and, and I don't know if this is terribly different in, in other financial planning businesses. Quite often, when it when it is that home care type package, we're saying to clients, you "Now there's a certain assessment that's done. You'll have to contribute a certain amount of money yourself to, towards it, and then somewhat, you know, maybe not quite so bluntly, but but kind of good luck go and find a an aged care provider to provide the services into your into your home, and and off you go. But there's a better way of doing that, I would imagine. How, how's like how, how do we how do we actually as financial advisors be trying to be really helpful for our clients that are starting to navigate this system? So I guess I guess the first thing that that I always like to clarify is that when we talk about aged care, it's so much more than residential accommodation. There's a specific program, and we call it the aged care program that um, delivers in home support and services. So the process for that is the same as if someone was uh, looking to enter into residential accommodation, is 
by making contact with My Age Care and, and registering themselves with My Age Care. And then the process starts from there. So My Age Care will screen people and work out should they, you know, should they be sitting at entry level, um, you know, and receiving services and support that are fairly minimal. And that might include I don't, domestic assistance or uh, lawn mowing or perhaps some transport or social support. But then as uh, a person's needs increase, they would go up to the aged care assessment team. And so the ACATS or in Victoria, it's the ACAS, Aged Care Assessment Service, uh, they're teams of clinicians and they're positioned right across the country uh, assessing older people in their in their locations. So the ACAT are the team that approve for entry into residential care. They're also the team that approve for that full range of in-home uh, programs and the services and support aligned with that. So I guess, um, you know, for financial advisors, when someone comes to you and says, you know, mum or dad or, you know, might be themselves is needing a little bit more help at home. Um, and it's interesting, often we, the next, the next uh, you know, part of the conversation that, that we hear is, I might have to think about putting mum into a nursing home. And, you know, uh, we say stop right there. There's so much more that you can get before you need to take that next step. You know, going from someone that's perhaps not receiving any formal support or that support might be coming from the family to then be considering moving into residential accommodation is a giant leap. And there's a lot more that, you know, that, that people can receive to keep them at home for as long as possible. So certainly getting that financial advice for down the track, uh, if someone was to move into residential accommodation is absolutely appropriate. But interim, um, you know, they could get uh, approval for a home care package, which there's four different levels of those. So level one starts at about um, it's just over $10,000 per year. And you can use that for different kinds of services and support right up to a level four home care package, which is just under $60,000 of funding per year. Yeah. Um, you know, there's also another fantastic program. It's my favorite program called Short-Term Restorative Care. And that program, again, approved by the Aged Care Assessment Team or the ACATS, is funded at $243 per day. It's the duration of short-term restorative care is eight weeks. So if you multiply that 243 by 56 days, you're looking at $13,600 of funding for eight weeks. So it's, you know, it's it's reasonably significant funding. Uh, and the goal of that is actually to support a person or to optimise their independence, to to help them regain their function so that they can be as well and as able as possible. And then uh, we typically, in the work that we do, we try to position our clients um, to be approved for short-term restorative care because it's such a fantastic program and has amazing outcomes. And then after they've completed that eight weeks, they could go back and get uh, approval for another eight weeks. People are allowed to have uh, two of those programs in a 12-month period. And then after that, whether they have one or two of those programs, they would wait to be assigned their home care package. Um, and that could be at a level one or a level four. And then once they're assigned that home care package, that package stays with them until they don't need it anymore. So, you know, typically that would be when a person then entered residential accommodation or if they passed away. Yeah, right. So you, you mentioned so kind of some entry-level assistance like in in the beginning of what you were just explaining there is that is that like the level one package or is that different to the level one package mm, it it's different i mean right. a level one package at around ten thousand dollars a year it, it's it's pretty lean so it's not yeah. going to give you much beyond basic care but at that entry level um the workforce that assesses for that is called the regional assessment service um very separate to the acats um, and so they're assessing for support and services under a chunk of funding known as the Commonwealth Home Support Program. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Australia-wide. So anyone sitting anywhere in Australia uh, could be eligible and is likely to be eligible for these entry-level services. Uh, so it's it's you know it's not a bad place to start. 
Um, but certainly if people are relying more and more on family or neighbours or friends to support them and they have perhaps some complex or chronic health issues, then they might be looking at assessment with an aged care assessment team. Yeah, right. And and that, that short-term... Um... Was it, what, did you, what did you say? It was short-term yeah, restorative, short -term care. restorative care. I'm glad you just that said that again because I wanted to circle back to that because yeah. you're going to love this. That's the only program uh, at the moment that's not subject to means testing. I was, I was, I was about to ask you to yep. say, so if my young client that's got $5 million in her self uh -huh. super fund that otherwise would be paying top fees for, for all of this in you know, a home care or, yep. or residential aged care, it's, it's not means tested? No. It's not. Yeah, right. Now, whether that changes in the future, and there are changes happening with the aged care reforms where uh, the short-term restorative care program and the home care package program are going to merge and be known as support at home. Uh, and we're anticipating that happening. Um, well, there has been some delays, um, you know, maybe maybe the middle of next year. It might not be till 2027. It's, you know, watch and wait yeah. to see what the department decides. But at this point in time, for people who have $5 million in the bank mm. or, or you know, um, are very well funded, um, they will not be ineligible and they will not be means tested uh, for short-term restorative care. Yep. And so what do you, so does it, does it work similar to a, one of the home care packages you mentioned, you get a couple of hundred dollars a day kind of allowance of, of sorts. How do, you, how do you then use that? couple of hundred yeah. dollars. Yep. So, uh, you know, the when you get approved for short-term restorative care or a home care package, uh, the allocation of funding or the subsidy uh, for home care packages occurs monthly. But with short-term restorative care or STRC, because it's such a short, even though it's $243 per day, because it's such a short uh, period of time being eight weeks, that funding is essentially available at the get-go. So we acknowledge that for the duration of the eight weeks that person is, uh, you know, has access to, uh, you know, that $13,600. Now, the pro it ha does have to go through a provider. Uh, that funding, same as home care packages, is not deposited into someone's bank account for them to use at their discretion. It's, it's got to go via a provider. And so when a person begins their eight-week STRC program, it's a given that you're going to spend that entire amount. So straight away, and because eight weeks goes really quickly, we're engaging um, allied health professionals and nurses. So the goal of short-term restorative care and the reason it's funded so well is it has a, a, a clinical aim of re-abling or enabling people. So the idea is you get a range of clinicians involved to support the person regain their independence or optimize their function. So typically it would be, you know, nurses, exercise physiologists, occupational therapists, might be psychologists or dietitians or physios, uh, because clinicians cost more. And that's, you know, that's why short term restorative care is funded so well because, you know, providers have to pay clinicians what they're worth. Mm -hmm. So over the course of the eight weeks, a team of clinicians um, goes and visits the, the older person at their home and brings uh, all that expertise and support into the home and is working with that person over the eight weeks to, to uh, help them regain their independence. Yep. Fantastic. And so how do you, so can you talk through, is it a similar kind of experience for someone that's, you now they get their level two or their level three or their level four home care care package? So I'm familiar with that the, there's a, a some type of means testing. So someone will have to contribute something towards it. There's, there's a degree of government funding and you get a certain allowance to, to spend. Yep. Yep. Can so you, can you talk through the process of, of then using that? Like how, how do you, yeah. how do you pick and choose what you're going to use that money for? Yeah, look, James, I'll just touch on first about, um, you know, the point you've made about people having to contribute that it's, it's yeah. subject to means testing. So certainly with home care packages, it is subject to means testing. Now, I'm not a numbers person. I'm a registered nurse. <laughs> so I only use numbers when I'm, you know, calculating medications or something like that. But with regards to the funding or the subsidy and the income tested fee, uh, which is what we're talking now that a person um, may have to contribute. 
I I don't know what people's finances are when they come to us. So I say to them, you know, jump, you know, if you don't have a financial advisor, jump on the My Age Care website. They do have a calculator there where people can get a rough guide. Um, but certainly many of our clients are with financial advisors, so um, they understand their finances. So if someone was to contribute the highest amount of income tested fee, we typically say to people, it's not worth your while accepting a level one or a level two home care package, because what you'll have to contribute with the income tested fee um, is more than what the package subsidy is worth. But if a person is assigned a level three or a level four home care package, even if they're contributing the highest amount of income tested fee, the subsidy that the government will provide them far outweighs that contribution. So we always say to people, take the level three or the level four. Even if you're contributing at the highest level, you will still be getting more back in subsidy. Um, so to answer your question, how do, how do you choose? How do you work out what you want? Well, it's really what's important to you, what's important to the individual. So there are a couple of models uh, of service provision within the industry. The the best known or the you know the initial model that came to market was fully managed or traditional, and that's most providers that you you know that we're aware of across the country. The other model is self management, um, and this came to market about oh about six six seven years ago, which. Um, it sort of took out that middle layer. So there are a couple of, uh, there are a few organisations around Australia who offer self-management rather than the fully managed um, option. And self-management means that the provider is um, responsible for compliance, for reporting back to the department and ensuring that the person is, um, you know, managing or spending their funding in accordance with their needs. The person then um, is the one who's responsible for going and sourcing what they want to spend that funding on. So as opposed to traditional or fully managed where you would have a care coordinator doing all that for you, with self-management, um, you take on that responsibility. Now, you know, for people who can manage to do self-management, it's I really like it because it offers people a lot more choice and flexibility. Uh, but it's not for everybody. You know, if you have an older loved one who has dementia, just the emotional toll and the the complexity of need with someone with dementia means that you're exhausted at the end of every day. And so arranging services and support um, is a little more challenging in that scenario. And someone might then opt to go with the fully managed or traditional provider and have someone sort all that for them. So, you know, when, when you're assigned your home care package, you go, what do I really want? So a reablement approach would mean kind of similar to the goal of short-term restorative care. And, and this is how I support my mum with her package is that we want to keep my mum up on her feet and keep her mobile so that she can continue to be as independent as possible. So uh, for my mum, she has an exercise physiologist come to her home three days a week. You know, she also goes to group exercise class. Depending on her need, she also sees a specialist podiatrist and any of these clinicians that are involved in a person's care, recommendations that come from the clinician's assessment like podiatry, for instance, my mum has been able to purchase orthotic shoes and custom-made orthotic inserts, which then, um, you know, optimise her balance and stability when she's walking. You know, she can use the she can use the money from the the whatever level package she is for yes. those orthotics and yes, so forth, absolutely, yeah. 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 So it you know, uh, financially it makes it achievable for her because she's an aged pensioner and just would not mm -hmm. be able to afford that. You know, domestic assistance, getting cleaning, uh, getting transport, getting someone to mow your yard, they're, they're, they're typical of what someone would utilise their funding for. Um, but if someone doesn't want to choose that, you know, to use their funding for, they don't have to. It comes down to what's important to them uh, and what their, you know, what's important, you know, what their needs are. What are they going to benefit from using that funding for? Yeah. So un under that managed model, is that, Talk a little bit more about that. Is it so? Is that managed in the sense of do you get like a menu of of services that the provider might be able to offer for you 
and then you pick which ones you want and then they coordinate it all? Is that how the management part works or is it different? Or, mm. or, or do they have someone that comes and helps yes you? Yes and no. So it, it shouldn't be like that because, you know, the approach is consumer-directed care. So the consumer, it's really important and the consumer is the recipient uh, or, you know, the person who, who's who been assigned that home care package. So it's a good idea for them or their family, their carer, um, to understand what their needs are so that they can say to the provider, this is what I want to use my funding on. Can you make that happen? So if we wind the clock back a few years before consumer-directed care um, was the expectation within the industry, then yes, providers would say, we can offer you A, B, C and D. What do you want from this? And in fact, many providers still do that. Um, but it's not its not really the right way to approach this. They can do it, but they, they really need to engage the person and find out what the person wants. Um, you know, we hear stories where um, providers will be offering domestic assistance and transport and uh, the person's needs are increasing and they're becoming frailer and they've tried to have a conversation with the provider about what else can they get? And the provider has said to them, we'll give you more domestic assistance. Mm. You know, there's not much point in getting more cleaning or domestic assistance if if your mobility is impaired or if you, you know, you have functional requirements that would benefit from uh, a clinician doing an assessment and then prescribing mobility aids or modifications to the home. So there is this sort of pervasive um, approach within the sector to offering people what the provider uh, can supply uh, or offer within their own team or their staffing, but people shouldn't be locked into that. They should be able to say, I have a relationship with my physiotherapist and I want to continue seeing that physio. I don't want to see your physio. I want to see mine. And the provider should be receptive to that and subcontract to that person's preferred physiotherapist. Is it, is that somewhat like how the self managed part works? Like, is it is the self managed one where yeah, so you self find your own physio, is entirely, you find your own podiatrist? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then there's some there's some central group that coordinates it all and probably manages the funding and so forth. But in well, but, that would be the provider. So the provider the the provider in it's so under under the self managed yeah. model. Uh, the provider will tell the person what their subsidy or funding or you know allowance uh, is for the month, and then they they do need to work with that person in developing a care plan. So everyone needs to have a care plan, and then the person will go through what's important to them. And we always say to people, write a wish list and put as much as possible on that wish list, and then get your provider to cost what you want, and that will give you a very clear picture of how far your dollar is going to go. Uh, and if a person had like, you know, eight, maybe nine, ten things on their wish list and the provider would say, well, look, your your allocated funding can will only be able to cover the first four or maybe five, then people certainly have an awareness of how far their dollar will go. But then it also gives them the opportunity to go, look, number three, whatever that might be, um, look, that can wait. I'll include something else in my care plan and utilise their funding that way. Can you, can you spend a bit of time talking about how how your involvement works in, in all of this? Certainly. So, uh, you know, as I've mentioned, the system is it's very, very complex. And we, we repeatedly find that people become so overwhelmed. We deal mostly with the adult children of older people who are really time poor, you know, the sandwich generation, yeah. have their own family, have their own business, working full time, and but trying to support mum and dad to live well at home. So they're, that's our typical client. Uh, and they'll come to us initially going, mum or dad needs some support, don't know where to start. And so we'll have an initial conversation with them where we can tease out and explain to them how they would go about getting that support for mum or dad. Um, often people say to us, oh my goodness, that's just, it's too much. Can you do it for us? So then we would take the next step to our next service. And we then, um, if we have one of our consultants in the same location, we can meet with the person and the family face to face. 
But because we offer this service Australia-wide, we typically jump on a video call or and do an online or a telehealth consultation. And so we do what we do what ACATs do, what, but we do so much more because we're not bound by time constraints like yeah. like the ACATs are. So we would spend up to two to three hours assessing someone on a telehealth call, and then we write up a very detailed and comprehensive report, and and then we take it from there. So we do the referral to My Aged Care, um, and typically, you know, the people that come to us. Um, what we don't take on are people at entry level. You know, if if someone can register themselves and they only need one or two services, we tell them to go ahead with that. Um, and, th- you know, they, they probably don't need our help. So we're looking for people that, you know, are needing a moderate to um, more amount of help at home. Um, and then we do that referral and we follow that through and we make sure that people get assessed by the ACAT and get the approvals that we feel that they're, eligible for. And then after that's happened, um, we support people for a little bit longer until they are absolutely clear about what the next step is. And then they're on their way and it's all sorted. Yep. Yep. And what does that what does that type of service cost? Um, so the one hour consultation is $297. And then our full service, it's um, it's just under three thousand dollars. I think it's two thousand nine hundred ninety-seven. So it's yeah. typically about fifteen hours of support over three months. Yeah, fantastic a service, well and truly worthwhile. And so, you, you mentioned at the start that most of your work is done in that home care, you know, keeping people in in their own home. Do you have a handoff, or do you like? Do you, do you have any involvement in when someone needs residential care? Like, can you talk about what that? Uh, yeah, no, that's that's a little more tricky because um, we support people and we educate them as to how to choose the package provider that's right for them. Yeah. But when it comes to residential accommodation, you know, I'm my little team is not across every facility across the country. So we typically say to people, this is what you'd look for. And we give them some pointers about when you go visiting and making an appointment, this is what we think you should look for. And then, you know, we always say to people, you need to go and see a good financial advisor. Yeah. And there's, I guess there's, there's other groups out there that, that that's their space is to try and yes, help with the aged care homes. And yeah. well, you're the first person that I've spoken to. I've spoken to a, a few different people that help with the placement in, in the aged care space, just not on the podcast, yes. but just, just in my day-to-day work as a financial advisor. But you're the first person that I've spoken to that's, that's earlier on in that process. And as I said, right at the very start, I my sense, certainly from in, in our business, and I suspect we're not alone, my guess is that financial advisors probably do a reasonably poor job of helping people <laughs> uh, through through that. Like, you know, the clients come in wanting to know the numbers, yes, but then they also want help with, and particularly because we'll have these relationships with the clients or, or the or the children, you know, of, of you know, mum and dad that need to go into care. You'll have these long-standing relationships, mm. and it's great that we're often the first point of call when, when they're saying, "Oh, mum or dad's not great." You know, we're starting to look for some help. What do we need to do? But as I said, I, I don't think, certainly in our business anyway, we're not terribly helpful in that first piece. But it's great to know there's people like you out there that. I think we're we going to be more to. helpful. I think you'll be more helpful um, after the listeners hear the podcast. Uh, yeah, James, so just having an awareness that there are options there to get support mm. at home um, before they bridge that big step into entering residential accommodation. Like that short, like even that short term one, I didn't even didn't even know that didn't no. even know that existed. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only person that didn't know that existed, uh, and particularly because it's not means tested. And so that you just apply for that through through the normal My Aged Care website, like you would. Well, everything else, or is it a bit different? Yeah, it's not that simple. You do, okay. you, you know, my age care is not simple. Even if your needs are fairly simple, the process, unfortunately, is not that simple. But yes, the to to be approved for short term restorative care, you need to get to the ACAT. So the system is designed to well, possibly not designed, but the system tends to push a lot of people to entry level services. Um, There's a perception that, you know, if you don't have any services at all, that you need to start at entry level, but that's not actually the case. You know, people can, can, that might have been relying on their family at home for quite some times and their needs are quite high. So entry level is not appropriate to them. They need to be at the ACAT. And then, you know, for short-term restorative care, 
it's getting across that, you know, your goals or your unmet needs are aligned with clinical support or having clinicians involved. Now, people really struggle with that because, you know, we have these conversations and people go, oh, okay, well, mum's seen a physio or, yeah, mum sees, you know, podiatry is is one of the ones we always need to address because people say, yeah, mum sees a podiatrist and I go, what kind of podiatrist does she <laughs> see? And they say, well, the podiatrist cuts her toenails and I go, no, you need, you need a you need a proper podiatrist. <laughs> so, we, you know, people need to go to a podiatrist and get a biomechanical assessment of their feet. Um, you know, they they need that really thorough investigation and then the recommendations that come from that. Like I said before, supportive orthotic shoes or orthotic inserts. You know, it's, it's so much more than simple measures. So, um, yes, people would start with my age care, but, you know, be aware that you need to jump through some hoops to get to the ACAT uh, and then to demonstrate your eligibility for short-term restorative mm-hmm. care. Yeah, perfect. And Carl, where can people find you if they if they want to reach out, know some more, refer some clients to you? Like how, how do people get in contact with you? Where can they find you? Yeah, well, we have a website. Um, you know, our business is called See Me Aged Care Navigators. So people can just Google that name or they can put into their, uh, you know, to the Google search um, all the W's, S-W-E-M-E-A-C-N, cmeacn.com.au. Our number's on there, on the website. We have contact forms on the website. There's a lot of great information in there uh, Mm. as well. So uh, take a look at the website and then reach out to us. Um, You'll be speaking with Michelle if you do make contact. And then, um, you know, if we're right for the person, uh, then they would either come on to myself uh, or Janine. Fantastic. I was just on your website before we started recording. It is a, it is a good website and, uh, and and Google. I just started typing in See Me Aged Care and it just, and it just pre-populated See Me Aged Care Navigator. So I don't know if you're doing any SEO type work or anything on your website, but whatever it is, Google <laughs> Google liked it. We... It, was just, it was just there. <laughs> Funny you should say that. We've learned a lot about SEO in the yeah. past uh, couple of years. Um, and so we understand how that works because we're a small business. We don't have yeah. big marketing budgets like, you know, the big providers. So we have to use, um, you know, our own skills and knowledge to yeah. get out there and get seen. Look, James, I might just take, uh, I, I, I just want to say one more thing about, you know, sure. people getting started or um, where to find support. You've been on my website. You will see that I've actually published a book called oh, my yes, parents are aging, yeah, yeah. what the heck do I do? So yep. that's that's my insider's knowledge and many, many years of expertise. Uh, and the book is, i got to say, it's, look, it's it's highly regarded. Dementia Australia, Stocksard, um, it's been acknowledged by the Australasian Journal on Aging for the quality of, of the content of the book, but also because I write so simply and I give the real life um, scenarios or case studies in there. So it reinforces what people are reading. We've just sold out again, but yeah. um, we're going to yeah. another print run, but people yeah. can buy the book anywhere. It's it's with all the national distributors. So Dimix, Amazon, you know, Angus and Robertson, all the independent bookstores. Um, yeah. People can go in and either purchase it or, or borrow it from their library, but it's a really, really great place to start. Yeah. What's what's the name again? My parents are aging. What the heck do I do? Understanding Australia's aged care system to support older loved ones at home. There you go. That's it. Well, thank you, Coral. Thank you for joining me. I've learned something and uh, hopefully anyone that's listening along, I'm sure they've learned a fair bit too and pick up a copy of the book by the sounds of things. Congratulations. Thank you so much, James. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks, Coral.